Do you want to do more than follow orders? Think outside of the box and manifest your dreams? Then you've come to the right show. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Holding Down the Fort by U.S. Vet Wealth. I'm your host, Jen Amos, a gold star daughter, veteran spouse, and entrepreneur. For season eight, we continue our wonderful partnership with the Rosie Network to highlight the motivational stories of personal growth, financial awareness, and autonomy in our military community. We're also excited to showcase our partnership with Blue Water Advisors. Well, we have a lot in store for you this season, so let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode here at Holding on the Fort by US Bet Wealth, the Rose Network, and Blue Water Advisors. Wow. We are at one, the second to last episode of the season, and two, the last interview. This is the last interview. We have saved the best for last. But don't tell everyone else that. <laughs> Just kidding. No, no, no. I mean, they're all equally great. You know, like when a parent says, I love all my children, that's my what do you call it? I can't think of what I was going to say. That is my diplomatic answer there. I love all my children. Now, it was, it's was it been such a pleasure interviewing everyone on our show at this point. All the stories I've been so fortunate to listen in on and help amplify and pry into. I'm so grateful. And so it's just very meaningful. You know, I can't believe we made it. We made it to second to last episode of the season, the last guest of the season, season eight. And let's just dive into it. And so I can chat more in the post commentary. So opening question for you. How does your cultural heritage influence your personal and professional life? That's a good question. For Iman McDonough Brown, she shares her journey from a modeling career to founding We Are Wonderfully Made a business that celebrates her Trinidadian heritage through natural and flavorful pepper sauces. As a military spouse, Iman navigates the complexities of frequent moves and building a business that reflects her family legacy. Moreover, Iman opens up about the profound impact of losing her son, Andreas Darius Brown, and how this personal tragedy has deepened her commitment to family, resilience, and making a positive impact through her entrepreneurial Ventures. Listen to Iman discuss the power of embracing one's roots, the challenges and rewards of entrepreneurship, and the enduring strength of family bonds in the face of loss. Iman, it was such a pleasure having you on our show. I feel like there's kind of no better way to end this season than with a heartfelt story like Iman's. So I hope you enjoy listening. As you listen, if you want to get a hold of Iman, check out the show notes of this episode to find her website, how to order some of her pepper sauces. And you can also visit our website, holdingonthefortpodcast.com. And if you're watching this, if you're listening to this when the episode is released, it will be the first episode that appears on the website. Otherwise, go ahead and check the search bar, plug in the episode number 204, that's 204, and you'll be able to find Iman's episode and check out the show notes and how to get a hold of her and how to support her business. So Iman, it was great having you to our listeners listen in on how Iman blends Trinidadian heritage and family values with her entrepreneurial spirit. Happy listening or watching because this is also available on YouTube, which the direct link is available in the show notes. Enjoy. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode here at Holding on the Fords. I am so excited to be introducing you all to Iman McDonough Brown. She is the CEO and co-founder of We Are Wonderfully Made. Iman, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Yes, I'm so excited. I love our like 10 minute offline conversation before we (laughs) officially started talking. (laughs) Um, And for those who were not so fortunate to eavesdrop in our conversation and are learning about you for the first time, one of the questions I always love opening up with, especially this season, is just give us a quick snapshot of your life, specifically what keeps you busy and or excited about life nowadays. 
I mean, off the bat, what keeps me busy is we are wonderfully made. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we, we live in Jersey. I live with my husband, our two dogs, one tiny dog and one giant dog. We have a mini poodle and a, a cane corso. So they also keep us busy. And, you know, running the business is full time now. You know, I used to have other jobs, but I've kind of scaled back on those and just I spend all my time now on We Are Wonderfully Made. So it's it's been a needed change, a busy change and, and a, a happy change. So that's wonderful. I mean, you went from acting to modeling to hot sauces. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so tell us a little bit about that transition that just feels like a very like 180 transition <laughs> yeah yeah so I went to college I went to Penn State University and I graduated a semester early and mm -hmm. going into fashion was kind of I guess you could say I decided that that was something I wanted to do like middle of high school but I wasn't mm -hmm. you know sure how I was going to do it and there's always so much like you know it's a scam and that you know I'm like so I'm like if I'm going to do this I'm going to do this the smartest way possible so it wasn't until I knew I was going to graduate early. And right before that last semester, I found a photographer, took some pictures. Um, I went with yeah. my mom. She met the photographer. And, you know, it was just a very cute little thing. And I put them online. And within a couple of weeks, a management company had reached out to me. And I met with them down in Miami. We took some more pictures. And they set me up with meetings with some agencies in New York. And we decided on which one we wanted to do. And I signed the contract my last semester of college. And after I graduated, I went straight into the business. Wow. I'm from New York. I grew up on Long Island. So I just went back home and just started working. And it's been over a decade of doing that. And, you know, wow. with, with being a military spouse, you know, we moved around a bit. And so I spent a lot of my career in New York, but we also spent about three years in California. And that was where I started doing some commercial acting in LA. Mm. And I had the time of my life. It was really fun. But, you know, with kind of COVID and just the swing of life, things just started to kind of change. And I was like, I don't know if I kind of want to stick around as much or maybe I'll just do it a little bit. And so it kind of just got to a point of like petering out. And mm -hmm. But before it did was when I started Wonderfully Made because I always wanted my own thing. And I think mm -hmm. that always had that bone like from my father because my father is an entrepreneur. So I grew up with that kind of spirit and yeah. in that drive. And it's, you know, I laugh because I still have the notebooks of like just pages and pages of just trying to be like, oh, what do I want to do? What do I really care enough about to commit mm -hmm. all my extra time and all my income to? It took a really long time to figure out what that was. And it wasn't until my grandmother was over a house in New York and she was always around. I grew up with her. Mm -hmm. but at some point she moved out to the West Coast. So then, you know, we spent less time together. So this was one of her trips back. And always cooked, always taught me how to cook. She grew up in Trinidad. And so she taught me all that sort of stuff. And I loved it. And this one particular day, she was like, I'm going to make pepper sauce. And I was like, why? Like, I was like, I don't like hot sauce. I was like, I've had the other kinds. My friends put it on their pizza and it just burns. I don't get it. And she was like, she was like, be quiet. Just let me do it. So yeah, <laughs> so she just made wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just make it. Just <laughs> So she makes it and I was shocked. I was mm -hmm. like, this actually tastes good. I was like, my mouth isn't burning to the point where I want to cry. I feel like my food actually tastes better. There's so much flavor. Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about it too was that it was completely natural. You know, it's just a mix of uh, peppers and vegetables and vinegar and that's it. So there's no funky additives and all that sort of stuff, which I knew would be great. Yeah. Especially as somebody who cares about my own health. And so I got really excited about it and I practiced with my grandmother. We made it together and then I made it on my own and then I started giving it out because I was like, I know I like this, but does anybody mm -hmm. else like it? Let's find out. So yeah. um, I was really excited to see that other people had the same reaction that I did. And so that was when I was like, okay, I feel like I have a real business idea here and I think I'm going to take off with this. And my husband was deployed at the time and I was, mm -hmm. I was modeling out in L.A., and I sent him an email when he was on the ship. And I was like, look, I think I finally figured out what I want to do. And would you like to help me? Because I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, was like, yeah. he was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So he's been my Aww. reception. And yeah, so we, 
everything is homegrown. And I, I think for me, I realized that the longstanding passion that I have for this is driven by family for me. I've always been really close with my family. My family has always been my biggest support system in my life and anything that I do. And this all being so closely tied to who we are and how I grew up and being able to share that with other people and watch people be excited about that. Basically, what I got from your story is that what you do with We Are Wonderfully Made is really driven by your love for your family. And mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of inspiration and a lot of your family in some of your flavors, which I, I want to get into more of that later. But I, I want to talk a little bit about what it was like, uh, what your experience is like pursuing your career and then starting this business all while, you know, being a, a military spouse and your husband being deployed. Like mm -hmm. in my mind, I think, oh, these are the types of things like the types of industries where it it feels like you have to be like stationary somewhere to pursue them. I could be wrong, obviously. But tell me about like, I guess, how how you and your husband were able to navigate the balance of, you know, being together and pursuing your careers. Yeah, I think you have to know and respect who you're with. So my husband and I, when we met before we got married, we knew immediately that we were the type of people that people that wanted to grow together. We were both very like driven in what we wanted to do. So I think it part of it has to do with the type of people that we are. Mm -hmm. Very goal oriented, very driven. We have a lot that we kind of want to accomplish. But I will say that doesn't mean it wasn't challenging. You know, mm -hmm. when you love somebody, you want them to be close. So just on like a spouse level, it was challenging. But I guess I can kind of go through this will be kind of fun going through like the locations and how we moved around together. So yeah. We started dating when he was in sub school in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of and I was in New York. So we would take trips to see each other and then we had to go through, we were basically with each other from the beginning of both of our careers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then we had to go through the first set of orders and where's it going to end up because you don't really have much say at that point. And uh -huh. thankfully it was Washington State, not Guam. So we were able to, to survive, but we were long distance and I would fly out to see him and when he could, he would come see me and we just loved each other. And we were like, we're just going to do this because you're who I want to be with. But we were long distance. And, you know, so he did what he had to do in Washington. And I worked how I worked. And I would, you know, travel for work. So I worked in New York, but then I signed with an agency in London. So then I went and spent like a month in London. And we were just on the phone with each other all the time. Then he tried to get some orders closer to me on the East Coast. He ended up in Virginia. Mm -hmm. We had short period of time in Virginia. And then he restationed out to San Diego. And that was exciting for me because I was like, now mm -hmm. I can finally get into LA. Mm -hmm. And so we always tried to compromise on where we live, where we'd always get a house, like hopefully equidistant to like where we were. So with yeah. him being in San Diego, I worked in LA. We lived in the middle in like Temecula area, which we it was great living there, but the commute in that state ended up like a nightmare. It would take me like three and a half hours to get home from work. It would take him like three hours to get home. Then, so, you know, it has its challenges, but yeah. And then finally he retired and we decided to settle in the middle of both of our families, his being in Philadelphia, mine being in New York. And now we're in Jersey and in a happy middle. So yeah. There you go. It's like a good, like you said, good in between. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I really admire how very early on you know, you were like, you're my person, you know, and we're just, we're going to make it work. Mm -hmm. And I think that the challenges are hard. I think they would be harder if there was like any insecurity in your relationship. So it sounds like you two were, you know, for better and for worse, were pretty solid on that. Like you knew that you were going to be together and, and everything. So I think that's a, that's amazing. And to hear the long list of places <laughs> that you've lived in order to make it happen, I think is is really incredible. All right, I want to go ahead and transition now to We Are Wonderfully Made. And, you know, I never really thought about this, maybe because my husband is the one who like usually buys our seasoning and spices and stuff like that. But I do know that like when I go to a grocery store, there's just a whole aisle like dedicated to like oriental stuff or, you know, like ethnic, ethnic the food. ethnic aisle. Yeah. Yeah. The ethnic aisle. Well, and you have everybody in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's very interesting. And then you have like a whole other section that's like, you know, just um, like American seasoning and all that stuff. Um, and so for you, it's like going down that aisle though, there's only so much you can represent in, in an ethnic aisle. So tell me about like, you know, what you have noticed in the spice market, especially here in America and 
of course, your need to bring in your product. Well, I think that's all part of the inception of what I wanted to create with this. And, you know, I grew up in New York. We're a whole mix of people. So, you know, we have a better selection than most. And even still, there was not a single time that I went to the grocery store and went down the ethnic aisle and saw anything related to Trinidad and Tobago. They're in that aisle still, there's typically only Mexican, Jamaican, and Asian. And mm-hmm. that's it. And it's still only specific spots of, of each area. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I think Americans tend to kind of generalize the Caribbean as like Bob Marley and Jamaica. And that's great. But there's uh-huh. so much to the Caribbean. There's so many flavors. There's so many places. There's so much beauty and flavor. And I was like, okay, there's a huge hole here. This is a- so we started the company while we were still stationed in California and so we went straight into farmers markets, in-person markets, which is amazing because Listen. it was a pivot that we did because of COVID. It was something that I wanted us to do. And it ended up being great because you get face to face with your customer and who's interested mm-hmm. who wants to buy. And what was so fascinating was to see that 90% of people were like, what's you say? What's Trinidad? What's, I mean, people were like, what part of Mexico is that? And I was like, what? Like, I remember calling my grandmother and she was like, oh my God. She was like, she was like one person thought that Trinidad was in Jamaica. And I'm like, this is part of what I'm talking about. So yeah. huge hole that I saw that we could fill. And, and you know, as a kid and even as an adult, just walking down there, you never see yourself fully. Mm-hmm. I think being able to put that out into the world is, for me, it's super fulfilling. And I think it's been very exciting to see people try our sauces and have this kind of reaction like, oh my God, this is so different. This is, you know, and I, I always land on like, you know, it's, it's one thing for me to like what my grandmother did and be excited about it, but it's like a totally different feeling when you offer it to somebody else that you uh, is a stranger to you and they have the same reaction and the same joy and that same kind of experience. And that's, that's been really, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. You know, even in that, it's like funny because I don't really go down that ethnic aisle because even though I'm like, I probably would be grouped into the Asian aisle. It's like, well, Asia is a a large country, (laughs) you know, and there's so many different, you know, like, like there's just so many different ethnicities within being Asian. And, and so oftentimes, like, even for my family, we come, you know, I'm, I'm American with Filipino descent. Like, you know, we have to go to like actual, like Asian restaurants, you know, or not Asian restaurants, Asian grocery stores to even find a little bit of ourselves. But even then, it's um you know it's a bit challenging and and so i just really love that you saw this as like an amazing opportunity to represent your culture to represent your family you know most of all and and i imagine that it wasn't an easy process i mean did you how did you even learn about how to get a product out there to begin with like in the grocery stores <laughs> uh, i am pretty relentless with my researching on google but yeah it was totally a process i mean I started with, like I said, my grandmother and I was like, all right, show me how to do this. And you know, grandmothers, they don't measure a damn thing. So no, I had to like, just <laughs> they eyeball that, okay. everything. Yeah. Right. Okay, okay. Stop. Okay. And I'm like trying to take notes. Like, okay. She said, stop at this line on the blender. So I'm like, so there was that process. And then there's also the process that, you know, making sure everything is sound and done correctly because this is food. And that was like mm-hmm. a big thing for me in the beginning where we were just getting ready to kind of what I say, go public, like bring it to the public, bring it to the masses. Yes. And I was like, I put a stop on it. And I was like, I refuse to do this until I know that everything is done until I can find a facility where everything is, has the certificates, the licenses, FDA regulated, everything is good and clean. And I don't have to think twice about it until I figure that out. I'm not doing it. So that was a big process in the beginning, um, trying to find that because I feel like so much of, you know, people always say, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And when you're just an individual who wants to start something, you have no idea. You know, I'm not a descendant of Tabasco or something. I don't have insider knowledge. So it's on me to figure it out if I really want to do that. And so it was just a lot of like cold calling and just Googling and trying to figure out what's this word and how how does this company do this? And tons of tons of Googling and tons of like, I mean, Ryan had a friend from from college that ended up going into the food industry in some capacity and was like, hey, these contacts might help. And they didn't. But I was on the phone every morning like, hey, yeah, 
You know, I think I even called the Clorox company and was like, do you know who packages hot sauces in bulk? And, and uh, you know, but it's it's part of the journey. It's fun to look back on. And I, I loved doing that sort of like because arguably that's some of the most exciting time as a business owner is like digging through and being like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this. I'm going to figure this out. Yeah. And, you know, you end up phone call after phone call. No, 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 no. Until one person says, I think this person does that. And then you call that person. They're like, we don't do that anymore. We'll call this person. Then finally you land on somebody, the one person who can help you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And and it's exciting. It's all exciting. If you want to be an entrepreneur, that's exciting to me. That was fun. Yeah. Sounds like it was a whole treasure hunt. (laughs) Yes, exactly. That's a fun way to look at it. Yeah. Searching for treasure. Like for you, that sounds exciting. I think for the average person wanting to pursue entrepreneurship, cold calling is the scariest thing you can do. So what was the attitude or the mindset you had whenever you would pick up the phone, knowing that there's a high probability someone's going to say no on the other end? Well, okay. I think there's different forms of rejection. And I think (laughs) it, but this is also why it took me so long to figure out what I really cared about doing. Because Mm. I have had jobs where I did not care. And when I don't care about something, you will see it on my face and everybody will know and I will be out of there in a second because if I don't (laughs) care, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So knowing that about myself, I was like, I'm not going to start a damn business that's going to require all my extra time, all my mental energy, all my savings and all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to set myself up for that if I don't really care. And so Mm -hmm. that's why it's so important to really believe in what you have and what you're doing and what you're trying to do. What what is the point of what you're doing? What message are you trying to send to people? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that early on, it was super exciting because I went from you know, making a sauce with my grandmother in the kitchen to giving it out to people at work and having my dad give it out to his clients and handing it to literally anybody who would try it and constantly getting feedback of this is so wonderful. Where can I get more? I kept constantly getting positive feedback from strangers that were like, this is amazing. Where can I get more? Mm -hmm. And having that under my belt, that creates a sense of confidence. Like you already loved what you were doing, but now you see that strangers love it too. Then that's, that to me was fuel for like, I'm headed in the right direction. This is going to be a good thing. And Mm -hmm. so having that confidence and just that excitement of like, I totally believe in the product that I have, not just because I love it and I believe in it, but I know that other people will too. And having that confidence really, like I would wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and wait till it was like eight, nine o'clock for people to be open. And I would just call like, hey, this is what I'm trying to do, you know, and also having that kind of like, at that point, you have nothing to lose. You know what I mean? You're just, you're just looking for anybody to, to point you in any sort of direction. You're like, for me, I was super excited. I had great feedback. I believed in what I was doing and what I had, what I was presenting to people and I had nothing to lose. It's like, okay, they say no all right, well, they don't know who I am. I you know, barely got off the ground yet. You know, it's not that. Yeah. If you look about it like that, it's not that scary, you know? So, yeah. I love that attitude. It's like, well, you know, I barely got started. Uh, I haven't really launched this yet. Also, these people don't know me. <laughs> it's like, they just, they just met me like two seconds ago and they, you know, because they picked up the phone and once it's over, they probably have a million other calls or people to deal with anyway. So it's, I think it makes it that much easier to recognize that, When someone tells you no, that's not the world telling you no. It's just that very moment, that very second, someone saying no. And it's just like, okay, you know, let's just go to the next person. Let's just go to the next person. And I like that you're very present, like with your approach, where I think that, you know, for other people, it's like the no's like weigh on you, you know? So I really, I really like your attitude on that. Thank you. I mean, to be perfectly honest, the no's weigh on you, I think, as time goes on, it gets harder because you know, as you start to establish yourself and you still believe in what you're doing, but then when you have like other businesses be like, no, you know, you don't, whether it's, you don't make enough money or you haven't been in business long enough or you don't blah, 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 that, you know, that's hard. It's hard to deal with, but it always lands back for me on what am I doing? Why, why am I doing this? Because I love sharing my family with people. I love what I'm doing. I know that people love what we're doing. When I see people come up to us and be like, hey, I have celiacs or I have high, my husband has high blood pressure and your sauce is the only one that we can use in the house. It's such a good feeling. Yeah. It's like you got to hold, you hold on to the good versus the nose, really. 100%. Yeah. I know that you are a graduate of the Service to CEO program with the Rosie Network. So tell me what your experience was like going through that. 
It was pretty great. I mean, I like to be totally transparent and like I think it I think it might have been Ryan, my husband, who was like, Oh, you should try this program. And he he always does that. He's very good at like networking and I'm not. Yeah. I'm kind of like more I'm more like hermity. And I am innately I am quite shy. And so he's like, you know, you should try this program. I'm like, up oh, for what? Like I always hate doing that. I'm like, what am I what are you gonna do? What am I gonna get? Yeah. Or you know, or I'll be like, No, like I already know what what to do. Like I've already done that. I don't need to do a class on this. But you know, and he's like, No, just go. Like, you know, you never know what you're gonna get out of it. You never know who you're gonna meet, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, so I started. <laughs> so I was like, All right. Yeah. I'm like, maybe as a point, I should just start like kind of stepping out there more in this way. Definitely. And so I decided to sign up and it went really well. And I surprisingly got a lot out of it because we were working. The whole course was basically about how to build a pitch deck. And we're at a, such a point of growth in our business that it was like, this is perfect for us because yeah. this being able to take this seriously and learn how to actually do it in a way that is going to make sense to investors and the like, it was perfect. And I loved it. And I felt like I had a complete pitch deck and profile at the end of it that I could and and still getting ready to present to investors. So it was wonderful. Oh, that's that's so great to hear. I feel like that's like the number one thing that I often hear with graduates is that pitch deck. And just like, if anything, even if you don't like seek out investors, it's like you were able to create a very concise like message about what you do, who you help, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just glad to hear that that was a very positive experience for you. And yeah, I've got to thank the hubby for... <laughs> Uh, I know, you know, me. I'm going to put myself yeah, out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's wonderful. And it, it's just really great to hear. So I want to get into a new ingredient that you had recently added or your third, the third flavor mm -hmm. that you added in your hot sauces and that's pineapple. Mm -hmm. And there's something extra special about this flavor that is added on the label. So can you tell us about that? Yes. I did want to circle back to the pitch deck for a minute. If yeah, I could. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, just because the pitch deck is one of those things that I mentioned before, where it feels like there's certain kind of like secret things that you don't know what you don't know. And uh -huh. nobody is going to tell a fresh business owner, hey, here's how you build a pitch deck. You're going right. to have to dig and dig and dig and try to piece it together and hope that it looks good and you don't look like a moron when you want to present it to somebody. So being able to have a course where you get that and you learn exactly how to do it, it's great. It's definitely opening one of those like business doors that is not typically available. Yeah. You know, I'll say that, you know, my husband and I, we've been working together for like eight years now, but he's been in the industry longer than I have. And I feel like even to this day, we're still like refining our message and not that we're looking for investors or anything, but I feel like it's like, it's always like a constant journey of like improving messaging or trying to figure out who our target audience is. But what I really like about what I hear about like putting together this pitch deck, it's like, it really gets you to be hyper-focused with what you want to accomplish at the, at the stage of your business. And so it's great to hear that, like, even with all your Google searching, you know, this was really what you needed to be able to come up with that concise message for investors. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. getting into your next question, our pineapple sauce. So in March of last year, I gave birth to our first son, Andreas, and he was born on the 7th and he died on the 8th. Mm. Um, reasons why were kind of non-existent. Mm. I had a perfectly healthy, easy pregnancy and all of a sudden his heart rate started to drop during delivery and we had an emergency C-section and he just did not survive. They diagnosed him with something called neonatal encephalopathy, which is actually something that is increasing in number. It mm. used to be one in three every 1,000 live births. The number is now up to nine. And we were with the best NICU doctors in the state, and they very plainly told us, this is something that happens, but the problem is we don't know why it happens. Oh, my goodness. Um, and so that was kind of a huge shift mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Losing a child changes your entire outlook on life. It changes your marriage. It changes how you speak to people, how you relate to people, and what you really care about, what really matters in life will reveal itself rather quickly. And so we still had the business to run, and we were trying to figure out how we could incorporate our son going forward. I think, well, I know 
<laughs> unfortunately, a lot of people, when a baby dies, when somebody loses a pregnancy or their child dies at birth or after birth, there's always this kind of stigma and reaction of don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I will say as a lost mother that that is one of the worst responses that people have because every lost parent, if you are a part of the lost parent community, has a harrowing fear that their child will be forgotten. Yeah. And all we really want is to talk about our children and we love being asked about our son. We want our son and any of our children to be included in life and all of its events the same way you would if you were able to see them. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to incorporate him and really the business was always founded on family, right? And there was always that transparency. And that was always at the root of why We Are Wonderfully Made was what it was and mattered the way that it did. And so now we have our son and things look different than we thought they would, but we still wanted him to be a part of what we were doing. And we needed people to know that this is now a part of who we are. There's no removing it from who we are. It doesn't matter if we're talking personal or business. This is who we are. And yeah. you're you're going to get it, you're, whether you want to hear about him or not. So it was like, how are we going to incorporate him? And so little by little, things started to come into place just with our ideas and what we were figuring out to do. And, you know, at first I was like, well, we had plans to release the pineapple flavor. Why don't we, you know, put his name on it or, you know, call it his or something. And Ryan, my husband, wanted to start a foundation mm -hmm. to find answers to research, to fund, figuring out what is causing neonatal encephalopathy. And one of the biggest things that my husband and I felt was once you end up in this community, you realize how common it is. Mm -hmm. And I think what is just now being talked about is how common miscarriage is, and it is. But unfortunately, what's also not being talked about is that losing a child full term is just as common. And you don't hear these things until it happens to you. And then all of a sudden people come out of the woodworks. And for us, we just were like, why didn't anybody tell us that this was a possibility? Because yeah. if you, you can inform someone, there's so much less of the reaction that happens, which is shock and horror and why did this happen to us? What did we do wrong? What did we miss? What's wrong with me? This this severely isolating loneliness that happens in loss. And, grief. and so we wished that we had just known that full-term loss was always a possibility. And so we wanted to raise awareness because we feel like if we can just inform people that it exists, we are hopefully saving somebody the same amount of loneliness that we felt. And we're also raising awareness. We're also bringing to light our son. We are acknowledging other people's children that may not get spoken about as often as they should. And so we decided once we found the, the ribbon for pregnancy and infant loss awareness, the pink and blue ribbon, we were like, okay, we're going to start putting that on the back of our bottles as raising awareness. And then also with our foundation, we would like to let everybody know that a portion of all sales that we are wonderfully made gets will also go to fund that research and provide resources to families as well. Wow. I am um, admittingly, I, well, one, I'm very impressed with how you're just able to talk through that so eloquently, but like, I was getting choked up just listening to you, Ima, just yeah. so you know, I was like, I was like, wow. And you yeah. like, even now, I think you're like legit the first person that's like making me tear up in this season. Oh. So. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> Hopefully that gives you a good laugh. I, I can uh, laugh just about anything. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I'm so taken. I mean, I think what I'm most inspired by is like your value, like how you value like family. You know, it's like this, we are wonderfully made is more than just a hot sauce, right? It's a representation of your family, your culture and your son. And it inspires me because I just think about, you know, I think even about my own family and how, you know, initially, like I, I didn't really I came from like a family of farmers, you know, and from the mm -hmm. Philippines and they my dad joined the military because for economic opportunities. And, you know, I wouldn't have the life I have today hadn't it been for, you know, his sacrifices. But along, you know, along the way, 
there was a lot of like trauma that our family experienced. And I struggle with like what family means to me, like even till, till this day, like it's something I, I still navigate. And so, so I'm just so inspired to hear like just that solid foundation. I mean, as solid, I get family has drama. I know that there's no family that's perfect, but just that solid foundation of like family first, you know, and how you incorporate it and what you do and, and how you honor your son today is like, it just really, it really moves me. And I just love that, you know, like how your business really is, a, is it's, it's just a really good display of, I guess, how, how proud you are, you know, again, of where you came from and where yeah. you're at now and where you're headed. So I don't know if I'm talking in circles, but I just want to say I'm very moved by what you're sharing. And it's just meaningful. It To me, it's like, it just humanizes your business. I, I feel like sometimes it's easy to like for me, it's like I always have this aspiration to actually separate family from business or like personal life from professional life. I like to keep I try to I can't keep them separate because I work with my husband. But, you know, I always have that aspirational goal. And in a, in a way, I mean, maybe it's just a dream. Like I, it's probably just like a fantasy whenever I'm <laughs> you know fed up with my husband. But like but I just I'm just saying that like you inspire me to look at like in how you incorporate family into business in like a whole different way. So hopefully I articulated that well. <laughs> you did. You did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yay me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I was like, okay, I could talk through this. This, yeah. is, this is meaningful stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm curious if you had anything to say after because I, I got to collect myself. <laughs> no, I'm just, you know, like you said, every family is different, but I think there's a certain you know, it depends. Every family is different. But, you know, watching my parents work as hard as they did and knowing that my, you know, the two of them, both my mom and my dad, it's something that I started to understand the older I got, but just how much they sacrificed so that they could give my brother and I everything that they never had. Yeah. And, you know, you it instills this kind of like, well, one, you have a closeness with your, your parents, right? I would hope. And then it also instills this kind of motivating drive in you as well. Because for me, like, I want to be able to give back to my parents and I want to honor them and I want them to know like how much I love us and I'm so proud yeah. of, of us and where we come from and you know what they've done and and what they've instilled in me the confidence that they've given me in myself and in what makes me different and that's all tied into how I came up with the name and then you know having my son it really just compounded that family is number one, what I care about. And, you know, when he was born, my parents were right there with us. We all held him in the NICU, you know? So it's always a family connection. We're always, you know, together. They're always right there through the ups and the downs. And that's, that's what matters in life. If, you know, you can form that or have that with your family, that's at the root of, you know, what we're doing. Yeah. Preach. (laughs) I'm so inspired. I really am. So much where I'm like, okay, okay, Jen, we got to figure out how to steer this or keep, <laughs> keep driving this thing. Keep your hands on the wheel, Jen. We're almost there. We're almost at the end of this interview. Oh, I'm, I'm impressed with myself for talking about that. I mean, if I can be honest with you, this is the first time I'm doing sort of like a public talking about my son and what happened. This is, you are the first, yeah. you are the exclusive. Oh, well, sub. this is why I'm tearing up because it's so authentic. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. Still is still in therapy. You know, it's still of course is a journey, but yeah, it's the truth. And and yeah. what, did I, what did I recently I read that the the most powerful thing that someone can hear, that someone can say to them when they are in crisis like that is me too. Mm. And that was all I wanted to hear when it happened to me. I was like I need help. I need other parents. I need to know that other mothers and other fathers have survived this. I need I need to hear that. And so yeah. when you get to the other side, when you get to a place where you can talk about it and you can acknowledge what happened, for me, that's what I want to be able to do and put that message out is it happened to me too. Yeah. You know, you're, you're not as alone as you think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is, that's part of the healing journey, right? Is like knowing that you're not alone in this. And so, and of course you have your family to, to lean against. So it just, it sounds like you are taking all the right healthy outlets to grieve. And I think that, I just think it's so meaningful and I appreciate that. So, you know, so while we're on this topic, I, I figured I would ask you how you chose your son's name. I'm sure there's a, there was a meaning behind that since. Oh, uh, 
And so you haven't really talked about him. Yeah. Isn't that sweet? My father's name is Andre. And then my husband was really close with his brother, Darius. So we were trying to figure out how we wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. And my husband was like, it's going to be pretty awkward during the holidays when there's two entrees in the room and we're calling for Andre and we don't know who we're talking to. Yeah, yeah. So we found a nice spin on Andre. We chose Andreas. And for me, I always wanted a name that had nice meaning behind it too. And Andreas is has some nice meaning behind it, you know, strength and that sort of stuff and Andreas the Great and all that. So it was it was something that that kind of wrapped up what we wanted to do. So his name is Andreas Darius Brown. Wow, that's beautiful. I'm glad I asked. Yeah, thank you. I love yeah. that. <laughs> well, I just feel I feel like people don't just, you know, like Google a name. Yeah, you know, like there there has to be like a lot of meaning. And I know this one is extra special, you know. So yeah. yeah so thank you for sharing that. Well, Jane. well, Iman, I feel like I've asked everything that I wanted to ask you, but I just want to be thorough here and ask you, is there any other questions I, I should have asked you that I haven't asked you yet? I don't think so. I mean, I Personally, I can say thank you for asking me about my son. I always, yeah. remember, you know, those things are super important. You know, like I said, we love to talk about him and uh, yeah. how gigantic and heavy he was. He was almost 11 pounds. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So that it was very nice to get to talk about him. I thank you for that. Oh, of and course. Thank you for, you know, hearing our story and, and, sharing a bit about what we're doing at, at we are wonderfully made and i i appreciate it it's been lovely oh it's no it's it's my pleasure i <laughs> you know this is why i don't like to give like set questions before any conversation because it, it would rob us of you know me tearing up without realizing you know without expect you know just completely <laughs> blindsided me there thanks <laughs> which is why i don't mind crying publicly i don't have an issue with that i'm just saying like wow like i just it's just so moving again like i think the the key word here that i i got from your conversation is just family just family you know and you're a great example of that and you know just my love thoughts and prayers you know to you and your family and to ryan and to andreas and and i, I would just want to wish you continued success with we are wonderfully made Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Well, Iman, thank you. Thanks for being on the show today. <laughs> thank you. I had a lovely time. Wonderful. Hey, this is your host, Jen Amos. Thanks again for listening to today's episode of Holding Down the Fort by U.S. Vet Wealth. Visit holdingdownthefortpodcast.com to access the full show notes of this episode, including resources mentioned and bonus content. Once again, that's holdingdownthefortpodcast.com. Lastly, stay after this outro music for something a little extra. Thanks again and chat soon. Bye for now. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Post Commentary. Thanks for joining me here today. I'm just kind of curious if like, I feel like this Post Commentary is kind of like the Marvel movies when back then, not like today when you can stream everything, but back then when you would go to the movie theater and you would just like sit till the very end of the credits so you can see like the preview to the next movie. I feel like that's what I'm doing here with the post commentary. <laughs> it's like, what is she gonna say? <laughs> I just gotta wait for the outro. And luckily the outro isn't as long as the long, long credits that you see in a Marvel movie. All right, so I really enjoyed this conversation with Iman. Now that I think about it, I think she was the first guest in this particular season who talked about her cultural heritage. And, you know, I don't often talk about my cultural heritage on the show. I guess I kind of do from time to time, but I, I don't necessarily like lead with it. I think I lead more with the fact that I was a military kid, a gold star family member and, you know, married to a veteran and all the other things. Like I, I tend to wear other labels given the context of what I do with the show. So that being said, the question that I open up with for her interview is, how does your cultural heritage influence your personal and professional life? And I wanna say, well, everything. You know, my cultural heritage 
is Filipino. My parents were immigrants from the Philippines and hadn't it been for my dad joining the U.S. Navy, I wouldn't have been born as an American. I wouldn't have been born as a third culture kid, you know, I wouldn't be where I am right now. <laughs> you wouldn't be seeing me right now or hearing me right now, whether you're listening to us or watching me on YouTube. And it's everything. You know, I think that showing up on video is really important because it's one thing to hear me. It's another thing to see me and to see the full picture of who Jen Amos is. And yeah, I guess that's just kind of what I want to say about that. And I also want to mention that I want to give a quick shout out actually to this amazing nonprofit called the Price of Freedom Foundation. Actually, if you look them up in our search bar on holdingoutthefortpodcast.com, the Price of Freedom Foundation, you'll find that this amazing nonprofit organization documents stories of our fallen heroes. And for that, that was my dad. My dad, you know, served in the military for about 18 and a half years before we tragically lost him. And today, thanks to the Price of Freedom Foundation, you can read about it. My father's book is now available on Amazon. It's called Silent Soul. And I will be sure to provide the link here in the show notes in case you're interested in looking more into that. But if you want to learn more about my cultural background, check out my dad's book. And when you do, you also support the nonprofit that documents stories of our fallen heroes. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you in advance for your support. I didn't think I would bring this up, but you know, we are asking the question, how does your cultural heritage influence your personal and professional life? Again, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my dad and my mom. You know, again, takes a village, takes a village, like I keep saying. So yeah, great conversation. I hope that you even ask yourself, you know, how does your cultural heritage influence your personal and professional life? Let us know. Feel free to reach out to Iman or myself. Check out the show notes of this episode. Learn how to get a hold of us. And yay us. You know, I think there's nothing more diverse than our military community. So it's just great to get this kind of conversation going. So, all right, well, there you have it, y'all. That is it. That's it. I feel like I could just drop my mic, but I just bought this mic, so I don't want to. I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> That's the last interview of the season of season eight. And what a journey! What a journey! I just want to thank you all for being a part of it. I hope that you got a lot out of these stories, and I will chat with you all in the season finale. I'll be speaking with you on Thursday, and also welcoming the the official beginning of summer which by now, it's, it already feels like summer and I hate it, but whatever. <laughs> I'll still welcome it anyway, because I have no choice. There's a phrase I've heard before that goes, if you cannot get out of something, get into it. Meaning like, learn to love it because you, you, know, you have no choice but to deal with it. And for me, that's summer. So I will get into it for the final episode of the season finale. Till then, if you want anything between now and Thursday, you can always join us on our free portal, which is available at holdingonthefortpodcast.com forward slash portal. And there you'll get access to our private podcast, Inside the Fort, where I give more candid commentary. And it's just a mixed bag of lots of things, stories, resources, advice on podcasting and entrepreneurship. And it also gives you access to all the free resources available that my company has to offer US Vet Wealth and our partner with Blue Water Advisors, all the things. We just have so many free things we like to give away because we care about our military community making confident and informed decisions about life and especially post-military life. So if that's for you, join us at holdingonthefortpodcast.com forward slash portal. And until then, I'll see you Thursday for our final, 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 final episode for season eight. Not overall. We will still have a season nine. Oh my gosh, I just said it. Wow, just spoiled it. Oh well. Oh well, isn't that exciting? I mean, if you didn't watch, if you didn't watch this post commentary, then you don't know. You don't know that I'm about to spoil that next episode. But if you made it this far, don't tell anyone. Well, you know, again, cat's out of the bag, like my cat that keeps bringing home dead animals because he loves us. But anyway, I'm done. I'm going off tangents here. I'll talk to you later. See y'all Thursday. <laughs> Bye for now. Mm -hmm.